Hey everyone, uh, I'm back, and so today we're going to continue the uh, series of uh, cloning tutorials I've been working on. Um, a little update, yeah, this past week I had a exam and a bunch of homework, plus I am just moved into a new lab for my uh, final and third rotation, so I've been, things have kind of been piling up, that's why I've been... Um, had time to work on these videos. It's been really exhausted lately. And, um, but yeah, so today I caught a break. So I'm going to upload another part of the uh, cloning tutorial. So hope you guys enjoy this. Okay, so what, what are we going to talk about today? Well, from my previous video, what we did in the last one is that we had our design strategy for our cloning project. We designed the primers. Um, we made sure the uh, you know everything was correct, as in like the restriction size they weren't in the insert. We made sure the uh, expression will be in frame after it was uh, after translation. So everything seems to be good um, at this point. So what we're going to talk about today is um, what do we do afterwards. So. Um, we're, we're going to talk about um, PCR, well, just a little bit uh, about PCR. And we're going to talk about um, Agaros, oh, I can't spell, is this uh, Agaros gel purification? And, um, sorry, not Agaros gel purification, just Agaros gel um, confirmation. And uh, lastly, we're going to talk about PCR purification. Okay, so just three quick things we're going to talk about today. It shouldn't be very long. But, so, here were, are, are the primers that in my last video we decided upon should be the correct primers for um, amplifying this DNA of interest. I'll just call it DNA X at this point. Um, so, DNA X into our uh, PFAS back one vector. So, here's the primers, and after you design your primers, and after you double check them to make sure they're correct, what you want to do is um, check the TM, or the melting temperature of these two primers. Now, what you want to do is only use the uh, DNA bases that are exact matches to your strand. So don't use, like, you know, the nonsense sequence for digestion. Don't use, you know, the ATG or, like, the restriction enzyme signs if they weren't, you know, if they're not found within the actual sequence itself. So what I like to do is just highlight the part that's only found in the sequence and just copy it. And then what I like to do is just type in TM calculator in Google, and the first result comes up. And this is the program I use, so I just control copy that, and then control copy the second reverse primer, put that in there, and then just submit. And boom, it'll give you the TM degrees. Um, as you can see, the TM is a bit high. Like I said, I like my pr primers TM to be nowhere higher than 75, 75 be my limit. This is my personal take take on it. Um, there's been papers that said around 60, between 65 and 80 is fine. And other people have said, you know, over 80 is also not an issue at all, really. Just don't go, you know, too high or else, you know, the temperature is so high, it's just like, you know, because um, then, you know, your annealing temperature will also have to be really high and that can cause issues, you know, because if you raise the temperature too high, you'll start denaturing DNA. And, you know, since there is a denaturing step in the PCR, you don't want your annealing temperature to be, you know, too close to your uh, denaturing temperature. But anyway, so it's a bit high. So what I like to do in this case is start shaving off bases. Like I said, G's, G's and C's give the highest temperature increase because of three hydrogen bonds as opposed to two hydrogen bonds between A and T's. And since I have 24 bases and you only need 20, so I'm going to shave off three from each end and see if that changes anything. So get rid of three bases and then just rerun the program again. Control copy, first one. Control copy second one resubmit okay so now you can see the uh, TMs have lowered as predicted and at this point 
I would say it's okay, it's good to go. Um, it's still a little bit higher than what I wanted to usually, but since because we're designing primers for cloning, we don't really have a choice. You know, we have to use the sequences if these are the sequences. And, um, you know, I could shave off one more base, I guess, because this is 21 bases instead of 20, but no, whatever, it's fine. So based on um, this temperature here, it's okay. My neon temperature, I would just subtract five um, so track five from my uh, uh, highest TM, which would be this. So I will have my TM around like 72, I guess. Um, I'm sorry, not TM, uh, my annealing temperature. I will have it around 72, which, uh, which will be, which will be good. So, so yeah, um, my annealing temperature will be 72 when I set, set up my PCR. So once you, okay, so, so now you order the primers and you know, you have your primers and then you know, you make the proper dilution. Usually what I like to do is, um, what I like to do is have a 10 uh, micromolar final, final concentration of primer and then I take one microliter uh, of that and then use it in my PCR reaction. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I usually like to do. And um, what you want to do is, you know, just follow the PCR protocol, depending on your experimental project, and just add everything together, and then you run your PCR. Like I, like I said, I'm not gonna go through the whole PCR reaction um, thing again, because I already went over this in my previous videos. So, so yeah. So I'm not gonna go over all that. So we're gonna assume that if so, you run your PCR, you know what you're doing, so you run it, and then you have you know your product afterwards, right? So what do you do with it? Well, for a cloning project, what you want to do is um, afterwards you want to in a 50 microliter reaction, so right? So in a 50 microliter PCR reaction, afterwards, afterwards, um, run um, I don't know, let's say uh, around five microliters of that on 1% uh, agarose, agarose gel, right? This is very standard. You run agarose gel to separate, separate out your DNA. And uh, you do this just to test to see if you have the insert or not. And because our insert in total is around 1.7 kilobases, we should visualize a band around this area. So if, you know, if we use a DNA ladder like this, a 1 kb DNA ladder, and we run it down, our band should lie somewhere between here, right? So it should be roughly around here between the 2.0 and 1.5 um, uh, DNA ladder standard. So that's where we was hopefully get. And if you see that, then, you know, okay, great. That's wonderful. You know, we reaction work, it's very efficient. And afterwards, what you want to do is, you know, take remainder uh, of the your 45 mark liter PCR reaction, and then what you do, you want to do is PCR purify it. Now, what's PCR purification? Well, all it is, all it is, is simply just you know purifying your DNA and getting rid of everything else in your reaction. You know the salts, um, you know any extra DNTPs, you know etc. Like that. And everyone uses kits these days by Invitrogen or Kygen or whatever. So all you have to do is follow the protocol in the kit, and it basically what happens is that you run your DNA, your PCR sample through a column, and after washes, um, after several washes, you bind your DNA to the resin within the column. I believe is a um, silicon column. Was it? I think it's silicon. I'm not. 100% sure though, but anyway, so it's a column and your DNA binds to it and you do an ethanol wash which precipitates out your DNA, you know, which basically means it makes it even bind stronger to the column while it washes away all the salt and other contaminants that you may have. So it's a column purification process, again, it's all in kit form and it takes like, you know, 10 or 20 minutes, it's very quick. So once you have that, you know, you loot out your DNA and then that sample is your purified PCR product and based on you know once you have that you can move on to the next step 
and uh, I will talk about the next steps uh, in my next video because this is going to be kind of a short video anyway. But yeah, at this point we have, um, so at this point uh, we have uh, purified uh, DNA, you know, and this is from, remember this is from your PCR product, assuming everything went well, of course, that you do visualize the band. Now, if you don't see the band, there are several things you can try. So if um, your PCR fails, what you can try is, uh, well, let's say you see multiple bands, right? Then you might get, you might be getting non-specific priming. Then what you want to do is uh, increase, try increasing your annealing temperature. Um, that might help. Again, another thing is that uh, just be careful. Seriously, because in case if you have tons of PCR products running, it's very easy to accidentally miss, you know, add something, you know, or forget to add something. So be careful. Um, what else if your PCR is not working? What else should you do? Mm, let me think. Um, right, so you want to, you know, always keep, you know, your... Uh, Either your uh, PFX, sorry, not PF, PFU or tag polymerase, always on ice um, when you're doing PCR because these are very sensitive enzymes and you don't want to be just leaving them out in room temperature for extended periods of time. That's not good for them. So to keep them cool down, and you know sometimes PCR just don't work. Um, I know um, a student that their whole thesis was basically was just about the nitpicky things about PCR and sometimes you know so she's like the expert pretty much at PCR and sometimes you know it just wouldn't work like straight up wouldn't work you run it one time it works next time you run it same conditions it just doesn't work so if it doesn't work don't fret try again and it'll be more careful and if your primers are correct and your you know your template is correct then it's 100% guaranteed that you should definitely get a ban, you know, eventually. I mean, it shouldn't take you more than once, once or twice, really, to um, to to get the ban because PCR these days are so efficient, so automatic. It shouldn't really be an issue at all. So, this part of the cloning again is relatively straightforward. So, you know, to review. You know, once you have your primers, or them, you know, dilute them down, usually to around 10 micromolar. Um, reaction mix. Then you just take one microliter of that in your total PCR mix, which can be you know determined by your whatever protocol you're using in your lab. And then based on that protocol, you run your PCR in the thermocycler, and then take five microliters of that of each sample, run it on a gel to test if your DNA amplified or not. And then based on that, if it is correct, you go on to PCR purification. Um, to purify your DNA, and if it's not correct, you want to try maybe incre increasing the annealing temperature if you're seeing tons of bands, you know, being more careful, you know, keeping your uh, polymerases on ice, and also, of course, double check your primers again. Maybe some something in your primers were just screwed up. At that point, obviously, then you would know the reason why this didn't work. So yeah, that's about what I want to talk about today, and um, I guess I'll just Talk to you guys later next time then. Okay, I'm signing off.